Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to welcome you at the Hamburg Institute for Social Research. We are here in Hamburg, but we also could have been in Cologne because this event was and is co-organized and co-financed together with the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies in Cologne. And I'm particularly grateful to Jens Beckert, its director, that he did everything in order to support this, as we think, fruitful cooperation between the two institutes, a cooperation in which many others were also involved. Among them, Wolfgang Streeck, who gave us his advice in conceptualizing the conference, and on the Hamburg side, Aaron Saar and Martin Bauer, who have been on board from the very beginning of the planning process. The conference takes place on the occasion of Mark's 200th birthday, but it is certainly not one for the sake of celebrating the life and work of one of the most influential intellectuals in world history. This conference should also not be misunderstood as a kind of hermeneutical or philological undertaking which aims to find out what the true Marx has really said. Instead, the topic and the center of the conference are the dynamics of contemporary capitalism and how to analyze those capitalist processes in a meaningful way. But of course, any talk about these themes immediately has to refer to the oeuvre of Karl Marx, because many of the terms and concepts either used, modified or invented by him are still with us today. And yet, Marx analyzed capitalist structures of the 19th century, and his capitalism was probably rather different from the one we look at 150 years later. Thus, we necessarily have to prove whether Marxian concepts and which of them are still useful for analyzing the situation in the 21st century. And this is exactly the point where the conference steps in. Colleagues from disciplines and subdisciplines such as economic sociology, political economy, and economic history will re examine some of the central aspects of Marx's political economy and ask how concepts such as money, labor, profit, value, or forces of production can still be applied today. Therefore, the result of this conference will certainly not be a better understanding of Karl Marx, but a better understanding of capitalism. To repeat it again, our keynote speakers and all the panelists aim high, they aim at theory building. Before I hand over to Jens Beckert, who will introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Thomas Piketty, let me add a few more words directed to the participants who are physically here in this room. We are at the first floor of the Hamburg Institute, which more than 30 years ago was founded by Jan Philipp Remzma, who is with us tonight. We are glad that we are here. Being at the first floor of this building also means that you have already walked through its hallways. Therefore, I'm quite sure that you might have seen many posters, mostly campaign posters, either with the face of Karl Marx or quotations by him or even both. Let me assure you that we are not an institute for the study of Marxism and Leninism, and we are not related to any communist party. These posters are not there all the time. <laughs> they are exhibited only during this conference and they come from our archive. The Hamburg Institute for Social Research has the biggest archive of post-1945 protest movements in German-speaking countries, thousands and thousands of documents such as pamphlets, leaflets, diaries, letters of intellectuals, trade unions, social movements, terrorist organizations, political parties and campaign posters. And in the last weeks and months, the staff of our archive hunted for the, in, many, in any meaning of the word, most attractive and colorful posters to make this small exhibition possible. So when you have time between the panels during the coffee breaks, for example, take the chance to have a look at these oftentimes strange, sometimes funny, sometimes aesthetically beautiful posters that also show you how diverse and sometimes strange, Marxism was as a movement in post-Second World War German history. If you don't believe that, then have another look in our library where you will find three showcases with, among other interesting things, 
you will find an illustrated, and this I want to emphasize, an illustrated copy of Marx's first volume of Capital. That was about fun and entertainment. Now the serious part begins. I hand over to Jens Beckert, but not without congratulating him in public for receiving the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize last month, the highest and most prestigious research award in Germany. He will guide us through the evening. Jens, it's your turn. Yes, thank you very much, Wolfgang. I would uh, want to be very brief and uh, just uh, at the beginning extend the welcome to, to, to all of you, also from the, the Max Planck Institute uh, in, in Cologne. It's the first time we have uh, such a cooperation between the two uh, institutions, and uh, I think it was a wonderful experience to organize this conference together with you, Wolfgang, and uh, I hope that the conference, uh, and I'm sure it will be as positive, and then uh, I hope that also in the future uh, we may cooperate uh, in, in other um, projects uh, together. Now, my task here is to uh, introduce our, our first uh, speaker, Thomas Piketty. And before I do so, I want to say that uh, Wolfgang and me, we agreed uh, at the, in preparation of this conference to keep these introductions of speakers very, very short, simply not to take more time than necessary from the uh, speaker and also assuming that most of the speakers are actually very well known already to the, to the audience. And of course, this holds also for uh, Thomas Piketty, who is uh, a professor um, of economics at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris and also a member of the um, Paris School of Economics. In addition, also a centennial professor at the London School uh, of Economics. Not anymore then. <laughs> no, it's not even true. So um, uh, Thomas Piketty uh, studied in, uh, in France and at the LSE and, uh, in London, uh, was then uh, a professor uh, at the MIT and uh, in Cambridge uh, in the United States uh, before he came in the mid-2000s uh, back to um, Paris to the CNRS and then to the ÖHÖSS. He is, of course, best known uh, for uh, his book, which had been translated into English under the title uh, Capital in the 21st uh, Century. Uh, Piketty is an economist and, uh, and uh, as much, I would say, economic historian also with a primary interest in the long-term development uh, of social uh, inequality, not just income inequalities, but also uh, wealth, uh, with special emphasis also on wealth uh, inequality. Uh, Professor Piketty is involved in many ways also in uh, political advice uh, in, in France, but also in uh, England. So he's a figure of, uh, of public uh, statue also uh, in, uh, in, his home, uh, in his home country and, uh, and beyond. Now, today's talk uh, is entitled rising inequality and the changing structure of political conflict. Thomas, it's a pleasure to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the organizers. And, and so let me, let me start uh, right away. So this, this talk uh, is going to be you know, based on some new research that I've been doing in, uh, in the past two years. And I will present some results from this uh, work, uh, Brahmin Left versus Merchant Right, Rising Inequality and the Changing Structure of Political Conflict. So I'm going to try to present a lot of material in this presentation, but if you want to see more, uh, please go uh, online and, and see the full uh, version of, of this research. So wh what I do in this work, and I, I'm going to motivate the exercise in a minute, is something quite simple, which is to construct a uh, homogeneous historical series on changing political uh, cleavage by uh, education, wealth, and income. Here I will present results for three countries, which are France, US, and UK, uh, uh, from 1948 to 2017. And what I document is what I will describe as a shift from a class-based political conflict to what I will describe as a multiple elite political conflict, meaning that the 
high education and high wealth group uh, uh, become more and more separated over time, whereas they used to vote for the same party or coalition of parties at the beginning of the period. And so I, I think this has important consequences for a number of issues that we are all interested in. What are the possible explanations for this? Probably many explanations have played a role. Uh, let, let me list uh, three, you know, rise of the globalization and migration cleavage. Uh, new cleavage is also created by educational expansion per se, and the rise of higher education has created new uh, form of, of uh, 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 political cleavages. And finally, and maybe most importantly, change in global ideology. Uh, so the fall of communism and the lack of a strong uh, substitute for, uh, for a strong and convincing uh, egalitarian universalism ideology, I think is, is playing a role. So, you know, the elite capture and the political finance uh, problem are very important as well, but I think, uh, you know, we should not neglect the, the weakness of the uh, ideology that's, uh, that's proposed by, you know, the left, uh, broadly speaking. You know, certainly the, the failure of, uh, of the supposedly uh, scientific socialism embodied by Marxist-Leninist ideology uh, is, um, explains part of this situation. Uh, so uh, you know, Marx may not be responsible for the Marxist-Leninist ideology, and I'm sure we will have more time to talk about it in the question uh, uh, after this talk and in the coming two days. But that's, you know, I thought it would be appropriate in this conference to present this work in particular for, for this reason. So, The, the general question I'm asking in this research is why is it that democratic forces did not slow uh, rising inequality in recent decades? Was there something unique in the period uh, between 1950 and 1980 wh which was more egalitarian than what we have today and also what more egalitarian than what we had before? Do we need extreme circumstances like the wars, crisis, revolution, which led to the kind of social democratic New Deal uh, political coalition that led to a reduction of inequality during the 1950 period. So th these are the broad questions which, which uh, uh, I'm, I'm asking. So just to, to motivate, just let me show you a, uh, some, some basic uh, uh, evolutions regarding income inequality. Uh, some of it coming from my book, Capital in the 21st Century, and some of it coming from the World Inequality Report, which is a report that we published Uh, in Paris uh, three months ago. So this comes from the work of uh, over 100 researchers uh, now covering uh, uh, 70 countries. So now we cover most part of the world. One of the big limitations of my book, Capital in the 21st Century, was well, there are many limitations. One is that I, the political processes are a little bit treated like a black box, which is something I'm trying now to better explore. Another limitation is that it's very much Western-centered, so it's very much centered on historical series on uh, income and wealth inequality in Western Europe, North America, a little bit Japan, Australia, Canada, but very little out of that, partly because of difficulties with data access. So we are now able to access more data. We have more uh, uh, series for India, uh, uh, China. So we are not always able to go back as far in time as what we do for developed countries. But what we see for the recent period, so starting around 1980, is that you have a tendency to rising uh, inequality pretty much everywhere. So it's a simple indicator. Uh, the share of income going to the top 10%. If you had complete equality, it should be 10%, because it's 10% of the population. If you had complete inequality, it should be 100%. So, of course, it's always in between. But as you can see, it can vary quite a lot in between, say, from 20, the most egalitarian country, to, to 60. Or actually, I've not put the Middle East on this graph where we have 70%, which is even more. So, so you have rising inequality pretty much everywhere. Uh, although, different speed. And so this is what we analyze in the World Inequality Report. If you take a longer run perspective, so you can see, so this is the same graph as before, except that I show not only after 1980, but also before that. And you can see that the starting point in 1980 was relatively egalitarian by long run standards. So the period 1950 to 1980 uh, was, uh, was, was more egalitarian. Now this came after Basically, it is between 1914 and 1945 that you had a big reduction of inequality through uh, destruction of the capital stock, but most importantly, through a complete change in uh, political coalition and the rise of the, the welfare state and a number of redistributive institutions, which to a large extent were refused by the uh, economic and political elite up to 1914, and, and the, the political landscape has changed completely by 1945. 
I'm, I, you know, I'm not going to redo everything I say in my, in my book regarding this, but you know, this is a broad picture that's important, that it's important to have in mind when we look at the recent decade. Uh, now, if we want to understand the, the recent evolution, it's also important to have in mind that the rise in inequality has been particularly dramatic in the US. So here you see you know, the rise of the top 1% share of total income in the US has been roughly of the same magnitude as the collapse in the bottom 50% income share. So here we are talking about really big shift. You know, how can it be that 1% of the population has a share in total income that's almost twice as big as uh, the bottom 50%? Well, it's simple. If you want to have a bigger share with 1% than with 50%, you just need to have an average income that's more than 50 times the average income of the bottom 50%. So it used to be about uh, uh, 20 to 30 times. Now it's 80 times. So this is why their share used to be twice as small, and now it's twice as large. So you know, it's a simple mechanics. But in the end, we are talking about very large macroeconomic shift, which means for the bottom 50%, a complete stagnation uh, uh, of, of, um, of uh, real income over this period of time, uh, uh, which, is, which is quite unusual. Now, in, in Europe, it is less extreme, but you also have bigger growth uh, for, the, for the upper groups. So why is it that inequality has increased more in the US than Europe? You know, the, lots of mechanisms play a role, but clearly you have to enter into the... the the political machinery to explain why you have different policies, different institutions. If you just refer to globalization, uh, okay, globalization happened uh, not only in the US, but also in Sweden, in Germany, in France. So, you know, sometimes US economists like to just blame globalization competition with the South for rising inequality. But different countries with different institutions, different policies in education, labor market, minimum wage, uh, taxation, <coughs> Uh, uh, property regulation, you know, whatever, you name it, you have a whole set of institutions that can make a difference. Uh, education, you know, probably unequal access to education is particularly extreme in the US. So this is a simple uh, uh, graph, you know, showing parental income rank and probability to access university. Uh, so this is, this is a kind of research that also I didn't have at the time of my book and which now we are able to link up the income tax declaration of the parents with the social security numbers of the children. So you can see what you get is really, it's, a, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, striking. Uh, you, you get a, 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 almost the 45 degree line. So it's as if, okay, so if your parents are very poor, well, okay, you don't have a 0% chance, you have a 20% chance to go to university. And if your parents are very rich, you only have a 95% chance. Okay, so it's not... It's not exactly the 45 degree line, but it's, it's quite striking. So this is an example where the gap between the official discourse about equal opportunity and meritocracy, etc., and, and the reality of what we do and what we have is, is a bit extreme. And so it's, I think it's important to, to be aware of that. The, the estimates we have for, for Europe are, are a bit less extreme, but you, know, you also have you know, the reality of unequal access to higher education, and that's going to be important for the political cleavages I will uh, talk about. Change in tax policy. So I'm, you know, I'm going to go very short. You know, it's just to illustrate that in the middle of the 20th century, uh, the period with low inequality, this did correspond uh, to different policies, in particular in terms of tax progressivity. So you can see here, like in the US, between 1930 and 1980, the top marginal income tax rate was uh, 82%. Um, um, which apparently did not, uh, did not destroy American capitalism. Uh, but, you know, many people are not ready for this discussion, but the discussion is not going to go away. Uh, uh, if you look at the taxation of wealth, inherited wealth, you have the same. So again, US, UK led the process largely because in Germany and France, the redistribution was done through other ways, through a lot of destruction of wealth, inflation. And so there was less of a need probably of this very, you know, uh, you know, aggressively progressive uh, taxation of high income and high wealth. Uh, uh, another dimension of change in the policy uh, uh, space uh, is policy toward uh, property. And in particular, you know, we use, so this is a simple indicator where you have, the, this is a share of net public wealth in net national wealth. So in the 70s, we used to have a mixed economy in the sense that the government, broadly speaking, owned between 20 and 30 percent of whatever there was to own in Germany or in France. So this was a time where public debt was small and public assets were large. 
in various forms in different countries. Now, this has become negative in recent years. So negative means what? Means that even if you sell all the public assets, public schools, public hospitals, that's not enough to uh, repay uh, the public debt. So this also means that the owners of private wealth own through the financial intermediation system and through the public debt, they own not only everything there is to own, so they own all the schools to which we send our children, etc. And, and right now we don't see it because the interest rates are small, so we don't pay too much for the public debt. But if we had to pay the equivalent of the rent, we would pay them for the schools where we send our children. We will see the, the price to pay. Uh, and it might happen at some point. You know, I, don't know, I don't have predictions about interest rate, but and some people think uh, that it's actually not good to have zero percent interest rate. So Anyway, that's another issue. But, uh, but at this stage, private uh, wealth holders, they own indirectly through the public debt all the public assets. And they, when you have a negative public wealth, it means they also own more than that. So what do they own? Well, they own a, a right to get some of the tax revenue of the future generation uh, for them, in addition to the rent coming from the schools, hospitals, etc. So this can be even more negative. Now, this is a consequence largely of tax cuts uh, for, uh, in particular, the wealthier group, uh, which then were financed. You know, you had public deficit, and then you finance the public deficit by selling public assets. And so this is, uh, you know, you have more public debt, less public assets. China uh, has stopped privatizing its economy about 10 years ago, and they seem to stabilize at about 30%, which is not uncomparable to the mixed economy uh, system we had uh, uh, in the okay, so this is a very brief summary, you know, a lot of material just to say that the story of, of decline in inequality during the first half of the 20th century and rising inequality since about 1980 is very much a political process involving sharp changes in policies. So we need to better understand, you know, where, you know, how these attitudes toward inequality are determined. And in particular, why is it that rising inequality in the recent decades uh, did not lead to rising demand for redistribution, or at least did not materialize into policies that would uh, reduce this inequality. So one possible explanation, of course, is that because of globalization and increasing competition between countries, it's more difficult to have vertical redistribution. You know, take the extreme case where everybody with a little bit of wealth or income can uh, put it at no cost in a tax haven and there's no way you can make him pay any tax. And governments and public opinion agree that there's no thing at all we can do in this dimension, then you know, maybe the political process is going to focus on the only other dimensions on which governments feel they can, and public opinion feel they can do something. And if this dimension is, for instance, how much you open uh, your frontier to migration and assume everybody believes this is the only thing that governments can still choose, then, of course, the kind of political conflict you're going to have out of this is going to look very different because it's going to be determined by how people feel about this, you know, depending on their own family origin, their own tie to other uh, culture, other countries, you know, this will be correlated to their education or their income or their wealth in a, in a certain way. Uh, this is a very complicated process, but this is very different from the kind of vertical redistribution political cleavage uh, that, that we used to have. So that's certainly part of what has been going on. That will be difficult to deny. Uh, but I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit too mechanical as an explanation, because at the end of the day, unequal globalization is a choice in the sense that it's not very difficult technically to organize uh, uh, trade treaties and treaties organizing free capital flows with counterpart in terms of regulation, uh, common taxation of corporate profits, uh, uh, global financial registry. Technically, it's not, uh, it's not very complicated. You know, it's not more complicated than to impose sanctions to countries that don't respect free trade. You, know, you, you just have to write it down and to have the mechanism to enforce it. So at the end, it's a choice if we don't do it. So it must be that there are some people out there and ruling groups who in, at the end of the day, typically in Europe, you know, believe that after all, you know, competition between countries is not so bad. It forces government to become not too big and to make more effort to reform themselves, whatever. And so there must be some coalition who feel that this is in their interest to, 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 to have this going on, which, even though it involves rising inequality. So this is what we want to understand. So in order to, to, to better understand this, we first need to better understand you know, multidimensional attitudes toward inequality. And what I want to argue today is that this is an issue on, on, on which, in fact, we know relatively little. So let me start with the first example coming from French post-electoral survey. As you will see, uh, wealth is a, has been historically a much stronger determinant of political attitudes than income. 
property than income, which is something in the future, it could be that the, 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 the opposition between education and wealth and education and property is going to become even more important. So just let me show you the kind of data I've been putting together which I think is new in the sense that, uh, of course, lots of people had looked at the relation between income and vote before, but trying to look systematically uh, in a comparable way, uh, starting in the 1940s, 1950s, which is where we have proper post-electoral survey for these countries, I think is a bit new. So as you can see, if you look at the income profile of votes, so these are people voting for socialist, communist party, so this is what I will call left party for France. I will compare with the vote for Labour Party in Britain, Democratic Party in the US, where you have a simple two-party system, relatively simple as compared to France, where we create new parties all the time, as you know, you know which is part of the characteristics of the country. But uh, at the end of the day, putting together the, the socialist, communist, and radical party for the 50s and 60s, which was still a bit important, uh, you get a coalition, and as you will You'll see you have actually a very similar evolution to what we get with labor vote and democratic vote in the, in the US. So what you see is that, okay, high income people don't like the socialist and communist party too much historically, although at the end of the period, you know, the, the profile is a bit less than worse lobby. Now for the bottom 90%, it's actually pretty flat largely because you have counter, uh, lo lots of, uh, of counteracting effects. So like in the bottom of the distribution, in particular in France, you have lots of poor peasants who don't like the left too much for lots of good reason. And, and, and so that's why. Now, if you look with respect to wealth, so this is exactly the same graph, but with respect to decides of wealth. So one good thing in the French post actual survey is actually you have uh, good information about asset ownership which is very important, which you don't have in all countries. But whenever we have the information, it's a much more powerful determinant than income. Now, just looking at how these profiles change over time in a systematic way and comparing with the education profile is, I think, something that had not been done before. And, and I, you know, I want to convince you that there are some interesting lessons from, from there. OK, so what I do, you know, I construct this long run series. Uh, today, I will focus on France, US, Britain, 1948, 2017. But let me mention that some, there's some ongoing research on a large number of countries, in particular in Germany, and so far the German spend, uh, findings are very close to France, US, Britain. Now, there are other countries where it can be different, and we can discuss about it uh, later. But so today, I will focus on the uh, post-1948 uh, period for these three countries. If you want to look before that, you have to use different sources, you know, typically localized uh, election results match with local uh, uh, census uh, uh, data or the administrative data in order to read recover the individual relation between uh, uh, individual characteristics and votes. So that's more complicated, but that's something that can be done. Here I will, not, uh, I, you know, I will basically focus on the post electoral survey, except maybe one graph for the US where I use the localized uh, uh, data. OK, so main empirical finding is going to be this. You know, in the 50s, 60s, the vote for labor, socialist, democratic parties in France, UK, US used to be associated with both lower education, lower income, and also lower wealth voters. This is what I call class-based political conflict in the sense that people who are at the low level in all of these dimensions tend to vote for the same party or coalition of parties, which can be uh, prone to lead to a focus of the political conflict on redistribution, redistrib more redistributive policies. Now, this has become... The, the vote for these same parties, Labour, Socialist, Democratic parties, has become gradually associated starting very early. So it's a very gradual process, as I will show you, over half a century. And giving rise since the 1990s, 2000, to what I describe as a multiple elite party system, in the sense that the high education elites vote for the left, while high income and high wealth elites vote for the right, which I refer as a you know, intellectual elite versus business elite, so sort of Brahmin left versus merchant right, referring to the fact, as you, as you all know, that the you know, traditional um, uh, upper caste in India were divided between Brahmins, which were more the intellectual and clerical elite, as opposed to Kshatriya and Vaishya, which were warriors or merchants or, or a, a, a different kind of elite. Uh, and and this, this, this uh, evolution, I, I, I argue, can explain why redistributive issues have become much less important, uh, uh, much less central in the conflict, in the political conflict, and also can explain why other groups might uh, feel left behind. Okay? So if we want to explain the rise of populism which is something on which we have been talking about in recent years, I think it's important to start by analyzing the rise of elitism. Okay? If you don't understand why the, the, how the two 
main parties or coalitions are each focusing on a different kind of elite you know, in effect, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's more difficult to understand what we, what we associate as a, as a rise of populism. In support of this, uh, the turnout rate, you know, participation rate for the low education, low income groups have collapsed completely in all of these countries over this period. I'm not going to show this to you today where I, I will focus on people who actually vote. But the turnout results very much reinforces this. Uh, and, and you know, there's been no decline in participation for the high income, high education. Uh, basically, it's all from the bottom of the, of the, of the distribution. OK, so this is a, a graph which I will explain a bit more later. But this is a simple graph showing. So this is for France. You know, this is the difference between the percentage of university graduates voting for left parties and the percentage of non-university graduates voting for left parties. So if it's negative, it means that university graduates vote more for the right, which was the case in the 50s, 60s. Uh, if it's positive, it means that they vote more uh, for the left. And you know, as you can see, you know, this is a very, very uh, uh, gradual uh, evolution. Uh, now, uh, this is true also if you control for age, for everything you want. This is true also for the US. This is true also for Britain. And this is even clearer when you look. So I will spend more time explaining this in a minute. But this is, let me just say right away that probably this is the most meaningful graph to me, where you actually see the most comparable over time. You compare for each period the top 10% education. So if you have 8% of the population with a master's degree and 2% with a PhD, that would be the top 10%. And that's more comparable over time. And this makes, the, well, this doesn't change the general form, but this makes the evolution even more striking at the end, in particular in the US, because we will see that people with PhD and master really uh, vote Democrat. And not only when it's Trump, it's a more long run uh, phenomenon. Uh, you can see that UK is a bit lagging behind uh, uh, so, uh, US and France. It took more time for the very educated to turn to labor vote, and something that I will, uh, I will discuss later. Uh, I would love to show you Germany. Germany will look, from the results we have so far, will look very similar, uh, uh, you know, a bit in between uh, uh, UK and, and France and closer to UK in some way. But the general pattern is very, very similar. Okay. Uh, okay so, uh, the question, of course, then I will discuss, you know, what does this imply for the future? So, you know, this evolution, I will show that, you know, the fact that the high education people have turned to the uh, left parties uh, is not true for income and wealth. So for income and wealth, if we draw the same curve, and I will show it to you, it's still negative. So this is what I mean by a multiple elite system in the sense that the, it used to be negative both for education and income, and now it's positive for education, negative for income. So you have a separation between different elites. Now, is this going to continue in the long run? Uh, of course, it's very unclear. So it could be that high education, high income voters will unite in the future, giving rise to a complete realignment of the party system, where in effect you have a party system that has really nothing to do with the left versus right of the beginning of the period and, and should probably be better described with completely different words like globalist versus nativist, which is actually the way you know, both Macron and Le Pen will describe themselves. They will not say, I am left, you are right. They will say, you know, I am nativist or I am defending the locals, you are defending the international, internationalists and people who travel. So this is more the way they will describe what they are uh, uh, disputing about. And in effect, globalists will be the high education, high income nativist low education, low income, which is a little bit what we have in post-communist European countries. Now, US 2016 election and France 2017 election, we will see that it sort of moves in this direction. So is this an exception because uh, Trump was a particularly crazy candidate and the French uh, equilibrium was particularly fragile and could have actually gone in every direction after the first round of the presidential election? We don't really know. You know, the contrast with the UK we will see as of, uh, where, in fact, you have the opposite, where the multiple elite pattern uh, is actually uh, exacerbated in 2017 in the sense that the high income voters really don't like uh, uh, Corbyn at all, but the, the high education voters uh, vote for Corbyn a lot, shows that different party strategy matters. Okay, so my point in this research you know, is not to say that uh, you know, I can predict the long run with this. It's rather to illustrate the complexity of ongoing evolution and the fact that once you have an explicitly multidimensional view of party cleavages, uh, you can have very different bifurcations and, and uh, in particular political actors and strategies matter. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk. Uh, you know, I will 
start with French uh, results, then I will move to US, then I will move to um, uh, uh, British, and then I will discuss a number of open questions about multipolarity stabilization or shift to globalist uh, versus nativist cleavage or return to a class-based conflict. So let me start with France. So let, let me go very quickly on the technicalities. But basically, we have a post-electoral survey after pretty much every election in France starting in 1958. 1958, you have retrospective questions on the 1956 election. The sample size is not fantastic, but so some of the year-to-year -year variation are not going to be significant. But as we will see, this is well enough for the long-run trend that we are interested in. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start by presenting results on education, then move to income and wealth, and finally religion and foreign origins. So these are the elections I will be using. I will use both presidential and legislative elections. So these are second round of presidential elections in France. So you see that it's usually close to 50-50, at least when you have... So these are only the elections where you have one right and one left, so I excluded the second uh, round presidential election with uh, the extreme right, which raises other interesting issues. Um, so uh, basically, I will compare, you know, who voted for uh, Hollande versus Sarkozy in 2012, as opposed to who voted for De Gaulle Mitterrand in 1965. I will also use the legislative elections, because legislative elections are much older in France, uh, and, and, and in a way it's a better uh, testimony of the complexity of French politics. And so the results are very similar for the long run evolution. I I, I'm going to show you it's actually the same for presidential and legislative votes. Okay? So these are, you know, if you have broad left-right coalitions, you know, which doesn't mean that these parties are able to govern together. You know, there are lots of periods where they are not. And, uh, and, but given that I'm going to compare to uh, Labour versus Conservative and Democrat versus Republican vote in US and UK, this is my excuse for looking at these broad coalitions. But, you know, there's a lot more that should be said about the complexity, of course, of, of the vote for the Communist Party vis-à-vis -vis the Socialist, vis -vis, etc. There's a lot more than should be said. Okay, so let me start right away uh, by, uh, so yes, this is just describing, you know, just one equation, you know, where I will introduce control, you know, I will start by showing you the raw data, you know, who voted for whom as a function of education or income, and then I will use for a given age group, for a given education group, so, you know, this is really uh, uh, very simple and very intuitive, as I will try to show you. So here, the key finding is that we are going to have a complete reversal of the education gradient. So, one way to see it is the graph that I already shown you, but I think it's even more interesting to actually look at the exact uh, education group. So look at this. So here I, I distinguish you know, people with primary education, secondary, higher education. So at the beginning of the period, the more educated you are, the less you vote for the left. Okay, at the end of the period, the more educated you are, the more, the more you vote for, for the left. So look, at the beginning of the period, you, know, you have 72% of the population who only have primary education, so this is the vast majority of the population. So their children and their grandchildren, you know, some of them are going to go to higher education, some of them are going to go to secondary, some of them are going to stay, so to speak, in primary. Now, what's interesting is that those who are going to vote left 50 years later are actually those who have made it to higher education. Okay, so everything I'm going to show you is, is true controlling for family origins, which you can already see from this, because in fact, everybody uh, comes from, well, 72% of the population comes from primary education. So at some point, uh, you know, most of the population comes from primary education. And, and some of them will, will go to higher, some of them will go to secondary primary. And the higher you go, the more you, you recognize yourself in what the left is defending. I mean, for good or bad reason, you know, it can be a problem with perceptions. But, you know, at some point in politics, if you have a problem with perceptions, for many consecutive decades, uh, this becomes a real, uh, real issue. Now, this is true for, for these particular elections, but uh, if you look like all elections at the beginning, you know, 1956, 58, 62, 65, all elections at the end, this is the opposite. So it's really true. You know, it's not, it doesn't come like this, you know, by, so we have limited sample size, but this is very, so actually this is putting all the elections together. So you can see at the beginning of the period, it's always declining. And the end of the period is always increasing. And in between, this is sort of changing gradually. Now, this is even true within higher education. So uh, at the beginning of the period, if you come from grande école, you are even more right-wing than if you got from university. 
at the end of the period, if you come from grande école, you are more left-wing than if you come from university. So, so you know, it's, it's not true that students have always been left-wing or whatever. You know, well, maybe they are left-wing when they are 20, but when they, when they get older, 25, 30, etc., you know, they used to become very right-wing. You know, as a higher education you have, the more right-wing. Today is different. Okay, so. Uh, this is a simple indicator looking at university graduate minus non-university graduate, but what you should have in mind is that it's in fact much stronger than this. You know, you really go from a completely monotonically decreasing relation to a completely monotonically increasing relation. Okay, so this simple summary, you know, is a way to summarize the time series evolution, but it's more than this. This is statistically significant, so these are the standard errors. So, you know, the, the number of observations is not huge, so some of the year-to-year -year variations are not significant. Don't pay too much attention to 62 versus 65, and, you know, everybody has this theory for a particular election about what happened. This data is not going to be allow you to do that. But the long-run evolution is highly significant. Now, when you put control, so, you know, some people will say, well, okay, at the end of the period, uh, you know, you have these young people, they vote left, but this is because they are young. Now, controlling for age, so within a given age group, it is true that they are a little bit less left. You can see the blue line is a little bit below uh, the red line. But, you know, it's always been like this. You know, the young people have always been a bit more educated and have always been a bit more left. So, in fact, you know, controlling for age, which means technically looking at the same effect within a given age group, this reduces a little bit the level of the differential, but this changes nothing at all for the long-run evolution. If now I control for income and wealth, this is the same, well, in the opposite direction, which is now for, for because income tends to make you more right-wing, uh, and because on average, with higher education, you tend to have higher income. In fact, controlling for your income, the effect of education is to make you even more left. Okay, so this is why the green point is higher. But again, it's always been more or less like this. So this, you know, the, the evolution is, has nothing to, is much more robust than this. You control for father's occupation. Uh, it doesn't change anything. So this is really an evolution that's very uh, uh, strong. Um, uh, now, here, I, I look at this top 10% education versus bottom 90%. Well, again, you get the same thing as before. I think this is probably the most meaningful uh, way of looking at the data because the proportion of university graduate and primary education people, you know, changes so much over time. Probably this is the, the least uh, stupid way to, to compare the data over time is to compare uh, uh, decile. Okay, now let me turn to income and wealth pattern. Okay, so for income and wealth decile, I've already shown you that uh, the income profile of the vote has always been relatively flat within the bottom 90% and very sharply falling for the top 10. So I'm going to focus on this difference between the top 10% education and bottom 90%, and I'm going to do the same for wealth. So, uh, you know, this is the raw data I have already shown you for income. This is for wealth. So I'm going to look at the difference between the fraction voting left within the top 10 and the bottom 90. So this is what you get for the raw data. So you can see that over time, uh, the, the high-income people, you know, they still vote for the right, but less and less so. You know, this is getting closer to zero. 2017, well, it's very special because here it's an uh, election with uh, Macron, Hamon, Mélenchon. And if, so here I look at the first round of the presidential election, which, uh, and putting together, you know, uh, Macron, Mélenchon, uh, uh, Hamon, you have 52% of the vote in the first round, and you have 48 for uh, uh, Fillon, Le Pen, Dupont-Aignan, etc. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying the first half is, uh, is able to govern together and it's a meaningful uh, coalition in any thing, but certainly the second half is, seems to the right of the first half to some extent. This is very artificial grouping, and as I will argue later, uh, this is why I have put dashed line for 2017. You know, uh, the, the 2017 election is best looked at as a very unstable election with four quarters of the electorate of almost equal size. And so, you know, what's going, are we going to have the blue curve become uh, positive? I'm not so sure because, okay, this is without any control. If you control for the two, then the gap increases. You know, why is it so? Well, for the reason I explained before, which is that 
income, high income and high education tend to come together, but not always. I mean, if they were, if they come always together, of course, I could not find this. If the same people have high education and income, you know, you would have the same curve for the two. So, but on average, it, they are positively associated. By the way, the correlation over time has not changed too much. So, so the change in the pattern is it's not a structural change in the correlation between education and income. Uh, and the gap between the two increases because, you know, for a given income, uh, higher education make really uh, you more uh, left, and for a given education, higher income tend to make you more right, even in the 2017 uh, election. If you look at wealth, so here I do the same for wealth in green. So this is again top 10% wealth versus bottom 90%. So you can see that the green curve is always below the blue, that is always below the red, which means what? Which means that high wealth people uh, always prefer the right more than high income people who always prefer the right more than high education people. So this is, you know, it makes a lot of sense, of course. Uh, this is very significant. You know, it's always been statistically significant. So at the beginning of the period, so to summarize, you know, at the beginning of the period, so this is before the control, this is after the control, and this is looking at the top 10% education. This is probably the most comparable graph because I look at the top 10% education, top 10% income, top 10% wealth, controlling for every other factor. At the beginning of the period, you have this class-based conflict, which I described before, where people at the bottom, whether they are bottom education, bottom income, bottom wealth, they vote for the same coalition. And people at the top, whether it's high education, high income, high wealth, they vote for the other coalition. At the end of the period, you have this multiple elite, what I describe as a multiple elite system, I don't know if this is the best term, you know, tell me, um, where high, high education people vote for one coalition, high wealth people vote for the other coalition, they still vote for the right, although less so than at the beginning, and people, so, of course, income is a sort of mixture of the two. You know, high income is, it depends on your high uh, education, but also on your high wealth. And so it's not too surprising that it's in between. It also reflects different career choices. You know, for the same education, you can choose to go to the public sector, to become an academic, rather than uh, go to the bank, uh, think king sector, whatever. Uh, so it's, a, you know, income is a complicated combination between education, wealth, and other uh, choice variables. Uh, so, you know, if you have high education, you vote one way, high wealth, you vote another way. And you, if you have both high education and high wealth, uh, you know, sometimes you are a bit lost and you have to choose, but uh, uh, both, both, uh, both matter. Okay, now if, if I present the results by uh, origin and national origins, because you know, I said that some of this transformation could be due to the rise of uh, migration, uh, cleavage, and globalization in general, you can see, so this is the general evolution of the structure of electorate in France. You know, everybody used to be Catholic, now you only have six percent who describe themselves as practicing Catholics. I, I have not put the bar very high. You know, this has people who say that they go to church at least once a month, and maybe they don't even go once a month. You know, I don't know, but at least this is what they say. You have only six percent of them. Now the, the Muslim group, you know, I, I used to be zero, and now it's it's five percent. You know, which is not. Uh, huge, but which is a lot more than, than zero percent, um, and the no religion has increased. Now, if you look at the vote, so okay, we all know people with no religion vote for the left, and practicing Catholics vote for the right. This has always been like that, but the, the gap has, has been reduced a little bit over time. Um, now, what's more striking, if you, if you like to look at the Muslim vote, so you know, you have a limited number of observations, but it's extremely clear. So this appears in 1988, where you have only 1%. If you look at the 1997, 2002, 2007, 2012, you get a vote of 90% a Muslim vote for the left, which is very surprising in a way, because you could say, well, you know, the family values, whatever, are closer in a way to the, to the Catholic electorate, are not very close from what the left is, is describing. So here you can see that it's, uh, I mean, we all know this, of course, but this is very striking to see that this is really a major uh, disturbance in a way, a major transformation of the standard cleavage. Probably the explanation is that some of these voters, so these are people who report their religion. Uh, you know, they do what they want. You have about half of people with North African origins uh, who report to be Muslim, half, uh, well, a third who report not to be Muslim, two thirds who report to be Muslim. Uh, I'm gonna show you the national origin in one second. Uh, you know, probably the best explanation why they, they vote 90% for the left is that, you know, they feel uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that the, 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 the right, the other side is uh, threatening for them, you know, probably, uh, uh, and, and, you know, they probably have good reason for that. Uh, if you look at the, 
you know, the gap, the difference between the Muslim vote for the left, the, the non-Muslim vote for the left. Okay, you have big standard errors at the beginning because you have very few Muslim voters, but you can see that it's, uh, you know, hugely significant and absolutely enormous. You know, you have an effect of 40, 50 percentage points, you know, with a 90 percent vote, you know, much bigger than all the education or income or wealth cleavage I have shown you before. Now, this is partly because they have low income, low education, etc. But, but actually, you see, this is even after controlling for age, sex, education, income, father's occupation, this is still very, very strong. Okay? Uh, if, you, um, if you compare, um, okay, if you, if you look at the, the vote by national origin, so you also have a question in the French survey, but unfortunately, this only starts in 2007. So, you know, of course, the survey itself adapts to a changing reality, and so there are things you cannot see before. Starting in 2007, you have a question, which is, do you have a foreign grandparent? Okay. So you have about 30% of the electorate. So this is a registered electorate. Okay. The people who don't have the right to vote are not here. Okay. We are talking about the registered electorate. Actually, we're talking about the people who vote, which is even more stronger restriction here. You have 30% of these people who say they have a foreign grandparent. 10% have a foreign grandparent outside Europe. 20% have a foreign grandparent in Europe, mostly uh, Spain, uh, Italy, Portugal, mostly, well, a little bit Germany, but basically it's, it's Southern Europe. Uh, and, and so you can see that the, the people with, uh, with uh, European grandparents, they, vote, they don't vote differently. People with uh, uh, you know, non-European grandparents, they vote you know, 80%, 70%, 80% for the left. Now, the Muslim effect is still there even when you control for the national regions. Okay, so the, the yellow curve is, uh, you take people who come from Maghreb, who have low education, who have low income. Now, those who claim to be Muslim vote more for the left. Okay? Uh, for various reasons, you can come with different interpretations, but the, the effect is still there and it's still strong. So it, a lot of it has to do with the national region, but it's, 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 more, it's more than this. Uh, now, the people, you know, the issue of migration in France, you know, has become, you know, has always been uh, very tense, uh, at least for a number of decades. You used to have 70% of the population who say, who say there are too many migrants. So now it's about 50-50. This doesn't mean that the issue is less, that there's less tension. You know, in a way, I think it's the opposite. It shows that it's, uh, it, has even, it has become even more salient in the sense that you have half of the population who believe there are too many migrants and you have another half who believe that, no, there are not too many migrants. So this, are big, this has become really a big, uh, a big issue. Uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the, you know, the, the, the impact you know, on the vote, you, know, you can see that this has increased over time. So the people who believe that there are not too many migrants vote a lot more for the left, and this has become even more important over time, even controlling for the other factors. If you look at the inequality cleavage, so it's interesting. Here, this is a question which is, uh, uh, do you think we should, so it's quite aggressive about redistribution. It's, uh, do you think we should take from the rich and give to the poor? So it's very aggressive, which is good because the electorate is split. You have about 50% who say yes and 50% who say no. So it's a little bit like the migration questions, except that the, you have half-half in migration and half for redistribution, but these are not the same half. So basically, you get four quarters out of these two questions. So let me show you. So here, you have you know, the pro-migrant, pro-poor, so people who say you don't have too many migrants and we should take from rich and give to the poor. You have, so these are more the people who voted for uh, Mélenchon Amand, as we're going to see in a minute. You have the internationalist and egalitarian, so this is more the Macron electorate, who, who don't think we should take from the rich and give to the poor, but think we don't have too many migrants. You have the nativist egalitarians, who are more the Fillon electorate, and, and you have the nativist egalitarians, which are more the Le Pen electorate. Now, you can see that at the end of the period, you get almost four quarters, which is not obvious. You know, when you have two questions and which one all, uh, each one gives half and half, you know, it could be the same half. You could just have two half, or you could have anything in between. Now, you have almost four quarters. So when you have an electorate that's divided into four quarters, so this is what you get with the first round of the vote. So you can see, so if you look at the line, you know, there are too many immigrants in France. On average, 56% believe that there are too many immigrants in France, but if you take at the, the mélenchon amont electorate, which was 28% of the vote, only 32% believe that there are too many migrants. If you take the Macron electorate, 39% believe that there are too many migrants. Fillon, 62. Le Pen, du 21, 91. Okay. If you look at the characteristics, you know, university graduate, typically the mélenchon amont people are people who have quite a lot of education, but low income. Uh, 
Macron have both high education, high income. Fillon have a little bit less education than Macron, but more income and more wealth, also more property, typically. And uh, Le Pen electorate has no education, no income. Okay. So, so you have, and, and if you, you know, the, the, if you look at who voted for whom, you know, it's very well. It, this four-quarter election, it's almost four-quarter in the first round. You know, I don't know how much of you all have this in mind, but you know, Macron got 24. The more left-wing candidate got 28, if you put them together. Fillon got 22, and Le Pen, Dupont-Aignan, who was the candidate who went with Le Pen in the second round, they got 26 together. So you have basically four blocks between 20 and 25, and this is what you have. Okay, now let me go more quickly. So the US and, um, and, 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 and Britain. So uh, US, we have the same uh, kind of survey. We start in 1948. So this is the, I'm going to look only at the presidential election for the US. So presidential election, you know, it's simple. You always have, uh, you know, a Democratic uh, Republican candidate. I exclude the third candidate, but usually they don't get much. Uh, so these are the elections I'm going to compare over time. So we all know very well these elections. But as we are going to see, the transformation of the cleavage has been very similar to what we found for France. So first, if you look by race, because US, of course, is a country where we are, we are accustomed to think in terms of race, and this is also a, a country where uh, you know, black electorate has voted you know, 90% for the Democrats uh, since the civil rights movement, basically. Before that, it was more mixed. Uh, and uh, whereas the white voters you know, have never voted for the Democrats since that time. Okay, so if only the white would vote, there would be no democratic president since the 1950s, basically. So, so it's a very, very strong cleavage. 90% uh, vote among the black uh, for the democratic candidate, but very similar to what we had in, in, in France with the Muslim vote and the population with uh, out of uh, you know, extra-European origin. So in the end, you know, it's uh, this kind of uh, very uh, strong racial dimension of US vote. You know, it's, it's, it's maybe it's, uh, it's something we, we get today. If you, again, okay, the black are poorer, have less education, but even controlling for that, you know, they still vote for the Democrats, you know, it's extremely strong. So you're not going to uh, account for that just on the basis of, um, of this. Now, if you, if you compare France and the US in terms of racial structure, you can see, you know, the so this is for France, this is what I have shown you before. Uh, so you can see that the big difference is that so in the US, you have 12% of the population that is black, and you have 18% of the population that is Latino and other uh, so-called ethnic origin, uh, mostly Latino. Now, the big difference is that the Latino in the US are sort of intermediate in their voting pattern between the white and the black, whereas the Latinos of France... Uh, you know, they, they are Latinos in the sense they come from Spain, they come from Italy, they come from Portugal, except that they are not real uh, Latinos. Uh, well, okay, I look at my wife, Julia, with Spanish and French at the same time, but, uh, you know, the, the thing is that the, the Spanish-French people in France, you know, they, don't, they are not perceived as Latinos. Now, you could say, well, because the distance, the, you know, the social-cultural distance is much less than with Mexico or with Latin America, but I think this is endogenous, of course, to the social fabric itself, you know, so the education system, the health system, is able, at least in some cases, to reduce social distance in a way which, uh, which is not the same in different countries. So that's a big difference uh, when you look at the, the long-run outcome in terms of uh, 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 political conflict and ethnic origin between France and the US. But you know, so there are some common points, which is the 10% that vote very differently. But there are some big differences, namely the, the fact that in the US, in fact, the minority, so to speak, is 30% of the electorate right, is scheduled to become 40, 50, which is, of course, a big part of the, of the uh, uh, problem with, uh, with, uh, with the white electorate right, and creates uh, issues that are different. Now, if you look at the education pattern, you get really the same evolution as for France. So it used to be the case that the very educated vote Republican. And you see today, at the end of the period, people with really very low education, uh, they, they vote a bit more Democrat. This is because these are minority voters. But if you control for minority, in fact, it has become entirely uh, upward sloping. So you can see people with a PhD, they vote 75% for... Uh, for, uh, for Clinton, you know, I don't even know where the 25 percent are. Uh, you know, it's, it's not easy to meet them when you go to U.S. Uh, universities. So we have, we have moved from a downward sloping to an upward sloping pattern, exactly like in France. If you look at the difference between percentage voting Democrats among high education, you have the same evolution as in France. Uh, 
this is the top 10% education voters, this is the same as before. So this is the comparison between France and the US. Uh, probably this is the best comparison, which is the top 10% education versus bottom 90% after control. And you can see how similar this is, which is really very striking because the two countries have, of course, a very different uh, political history. You know, in, in the US, the Democratic Party uh, used to be the party of slavery, which gradually became the party of the New Deal, and finally the uh, party of the minority vote, and, you know, complete uh, transformation, which in Europe we usually look as very exotic and impossible to understand. Very different history in France with, you know, all these different parties, socialist, communist, etc. But in the end, you know, you have, you know, the evolution is very, very similar. So in the US, high-income people for the first time have voted Democrat. So you can see 2016, for the first time, the top income groups have voted Democrats because they didn't like Trump too much. So if you look at the difference between top income groups and bottom 90% income group, it has always been negative, meaning that the top income votes Republican, except in the last election, where they have voted for Clinton. So if you look, if you compare, you know, the evolution of the education and income cleavage, uh, so this is after controls, you can see, you know, you could say in 2016, you know, all the top education and top income are voting Democrat. Now, whether this is a new normal or not, you know, it's very much uh, unclear. Uh, this is, um, you know, it could be that, uh, you know, when the Republicans come with a, uh, with a more reasonable candidate uh, than Trump, uh, the high-income people will return to the Republican Party. So it's very difficult to know exactly whether, you know, this is, but at least, you know, this, this, has, this is going this way, which also corresponds to a very long run, you know, if you take a very long run evolution of the Republican Democratic vote, you, uh, using a, a local level election result, you know, with the state voting Democrats and Republicans, you can see that this comes from a very long run evolution which started uh, right after the, the Civil War. So again, you know, this kind of party dynamics which will tend to look from Europe as completely different from what we have, I think for the recent decades have some similarities. Let me go very quickly through Britain. So Britain, basically, you get the same results. So this, I'm going to look at the Labour versus uh, uh, Conservative vote. So you can see, you know, this, you have two parties that, uh, you know, alternated in power over this period of time. So this is Britain. So Britain is basically the same. Let me just mention one difference. So you can see Britain is sort of lagging behind so it took more time for, for, for the you know, British Labour Party to attract the high education vote, probably because the Labour Party has a more sort of labour origin and, and low education uh, you know, base than not only the Democratic Party, but also the Socialist Communist Alliance in France, partly because of the rural effect, the peasant effect. Okay, you know, but in the, at the end of the day, you know, we all know, you know, uh, Keynes in the interwar period who said, you know, famously that he would never vote Labour, and, and he said, you know, this is because these people, you know, they don't know what they are doing, they don't have a high education elite, you know, I will keep voting uh, Liberal until my last day. Well, he died in 1946, probably, he, so he didn't have time to shift to Labour, you know, probably he would have shifted, he would have become, you know, a good uh, Labour Brahmin uh, at some point, but it would have taken some time. Okay, so this is the British effect. You know, it, it takes more time for the high education elite. Uh, and I'm looking forward you know, to put Germany on this graph. Uh, you have a strong income effect in, for the labor vote, actually stronger than for the socialist communist vote in France. If you look at the evolution over time, you can see that the high income people uh, don't like Corbyn too much at the end of the period. So you can see in 2017, in fact, you have a widening of the gap between the high education people, the high income vote. So it is very different from what we have uh, in France and the US, where the high income people tend to go towards the same level as the high education people. So this illustrates the fact that you, know, you can have multiple, uh, you know, depending on party strategy, you can go at different. So this is with wealth. So you, we have the wealth data for, for, for Britain, and it's very similar than what we have for uh, France. Muslim vote also very, very strongly, 90%. Okay, let me, uh, you know, stop there, uh, stop with the uh, open questions, uh, you know, which I, I, you know, I don't have the answer, you know. Open question number one, could the transition towards this multiple system, could it have happened without the migration issue? So in the US, the usual story is really the racial issue. Once the Democrats got the civil rights uh, agenda, uh, the you know, poor whites started to leave the Democratic Party. So this all started 
with the civil rights movement, and there's no much, not much we can do with these racist uh, poor white people, so you know, it's not our fault, basically. This is the, the poor abandon the left uh, rather than the left abandon the poor. That's uh, sort of the story, the common story that you have in the US. Now, I'm not saying you know, this migration issue is not important. That would be very stupid, you know, coming from France, speaking in Germany today. And, but, but, but I think it's a bit too simple you know, to blame you know, the racism of the poor. And I think uh, the, the, you know, the, the high education, uh, you know, Brahmin left, you know, have abandoned the poor at least as much as the, the, the poor has abandoned the left. Or at least there is a big misunderstanding and, and there, there must be some reason. I think educational expansion in itself has created new cleavages which are difficult to solve. So at the time of primary, secondary education, you can have a very egalitarian platform, which is you want to get everybody to primary and everybody to secondary. With tertiary education, it's more complicated because you cannot get everybody to a PhD, so you have to accept some form of inequality. You have to deal with this through preferential educational investment. The left has not been very good with this, partly because the people who have succeeded in the education game you know, are quite happy about you know, their success and their merit and their sense of effort, and they have developed an ideology which is not so different from the sort of merchant right ideology based on effort, merit, and so the people who are left behind, well, you know, that's partly their fault, and if in addition they are racist, you know, why, what are we going to do with these people? And so, so that's part of the, I think, what has been going on. Now, what will be the long-run outcome? This is more, even more complicated. One issue I want to, to raise, you know, is the possibility, you know, in, in the U.S., this system where, you know, you had a sort of nativist, uh, uh, you know, sort of racist, poor white voting for the Democratic Party uh, and the... Um, Income, I wealth education voting for the Republican Party was very much what we had in the late 19th century in the US. And in the end, it is the Democratic Party that became the New Deal Party, partly because following the Great Depression, they had to develop policies like unemployment benefits or uh, public work that would benefit both the poor white and the poor black. And at the end of the day, you know, they sort of, they got both electorates, they went, they made the choice of the civil rights movement. So this is not saying that, you know, this racist left uh, trajectory will happen again and that, you know, Fidesz and Front National or AFD will become the Democratic Party of the future, you know, which will be uh, very sad in some way because it will probably go through, through uh, you know, a lot of very nasty uh, uh, episodes. But I think this is something we have to, to, to think about. And, you know, if you don't have a strong uh, uh, egalitarian internationalist platform that can convince uh, the lower education and lower income voters to vote for, uh, for uh, uh, an internationalist party or coalition or universalist party or coalition. And if we go gradually to this kind of globalist versus nativist uh, political uh, cleavage, then there's a risk that we, that we end up uh, uh, in this kind of, uh, of trajectory. And I think internationalizing the study of nationalist cleavage, you know, can be a way to, to find solution. You know, in the famous lipset rokan framework, there was very little um, discussion of the racial ethnic dimension, which is strange because the book was written in 1967 in the middle of the civil rights movement, but probably Lipset wanted to, to, to think that this belonged to the past, and, and, but, well, this does not belong to the past. Uh, a lot of work by political scientists in Europe, you know, tend to focus on Europe and not, not necessarily compare with the dimension of racial cleavages in the US. I think having this international perspective on nationalist cleavages uh, can be important. And, and uh, you know, building comparable series over time, you know, I think can be a way to make progress. Let me stop there. You know, why didn't democracy uh, reduce inequality? Well, you know, probably because you know, multi-dimensional uh, coalitions are complicated. You know, when you talk about inequality, are we talking of inequality in education, in property, in income? You know, these are all different in, in racial origin, in religion. These are all different dimensions which are not perfectly correlated. Globalization and educational expansion have created new uh, dimensions of cleavages. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you don't have, again, a strong platform to put everybody together, uh, racism, nativism can be a very powerful force to divide uh, them. Good news, I think, is that social science and historical research ideally could help us, uh, you know, design better strategies. But, of course, it will take more than uh, social science research. So let me stop there.
Okay, thank you very much, Tomar. Maybe you um, yep. want to sit here, first of all, for this uh, uh, exercise in, in class analysis, which uh, set us off for our, this, uh, this conference. We have 15 to 20 minutes time uh, for discussion before there will be a reception with wine downstairs in the basement of uh, uh, on the ground floor of this of this building. And the first person I have is Wolfgang Streeck. We need oh yeah we need to use microphones. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this was really very um, very exciting. Uh, I missed one uh, variable, which is gender. Now, uh, women uh, fit ideally this one wing of your multiple elite. They are, first of all, uh, today socially liberal. Th that has something to do with the emancipation from the traditional family. They are better in education, at least in secondary education, than, than men, from which they get sort of... Um, a meritocratic uh, uh, understanding of the world. If you sort of are better in school, you can advance, from which in turn, there's no, uh, uh, no um, redistributionist um, attitude to be gained from this, precisely also because when they get into, uh, in, in, into business, they earn less than men, which sort of, re uh, which results in uh, an equal opportunity uh, uh, perspective rather than a redistribution perspective. So, so this sort of coupling between uh, uh, socially liberal attitudes and uh, uh, anti-distributionist attitudes, I at least would expect that you find this uh, in a very strong way among women, more than among women. Okay, so that's, that's a very good point. Let, let me say right away that if you, there's a lot of material in this research that I could not present here and which is in the paper. Uh, this includes the results on changing turnout, which is very important, so the fall of turnout for low education, low income. And this also includes the gender pattern. So this is in the paper. Let me tell you what I, what I find. So f first of all, and this goes very much in, in the direction you indicate. So, First of all, all the results I've presented here are always, when I control for age, I also control for gender. Okay, so they are true within uh, gender. Okay, this is not uh, this is not true only for men or only for women or just because the women are getting more educated over time. This is true within gender. That being said, you are right to say to point out that there's also some specific evolution to gender. So what is the specific evolution? Well, it's actually something that has been studied already a lot in the past, and it's not new in this research, and that's why I did not emphasize, which is that the, the women tend to uh, used to vote right, and now they vote left. So if you like, in the 50s, 60s, in these three countries, women vote right much more than, than men, uh, including controlling for pretty much everything. Whereas today, so actually there's a difference. In the US, they vote a lot more Democrat. So they have really turned from Republican, strongly Republican to strongly Democrat. In, in UK and France, they are sort of neutral today. They are not, uh, you know, it's, uh, they vote a bit more left, but it's not, it's not very strong. So, uh, wh wh so why, uh, where does this evolution come from? It's, uh, Okay, I don't have much new to say on this in this paper, so I did not answer that. The, the, certainly, uh, the issue of gender inequality and, and the, the, the uh, you know the sort of patriarchal societies of the 50s, 60s, uh, it's a very different atmosphere from what you have today. So, what, what, why would the woman vote for the right at the time of patriarchal society is, uh, is still uh, not so uh, entirely clear. I mean, it could be that you are pushed to a certain role. And you, you, you also uh, adopt the values that are more consistent where, with the role where you have uh, put, been put into. All that I know is that in the, you know, the only variable that make it go away <laughs> is religion. So if you control for uh, self-expressed uh, religious uh, belief, the women of the 50s and 60s in France and Britain, and, and US, I believe, these for France and Britain are not right wing anymore. But this is not really an explanation because what do they express by uh, you know being uh, expressing more religious beliefs has certainly to do with the view of, of the woman's role and men's role and the whole fabric of society. And for the recent evolution, I think you could be right that. Uh, uh, but so just to, uh, so if if we were to go to more gender inequality in income, uh, then the the the, the woman. Uh, 
Brahmin vote will become more redistributive. This is. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't say that. But, but, but what I did say was that right now the, the main grievance of women who are in uh, uh, working yeah, is. Uh, is equal opportunity. Is that they have less income than the men, which for them uh, would sort of put them onto an affirmative action uh, uh, equal opportunity path. Rather than redistribution. Rather than redistribution, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you um, put up your hand, then I will try to... Thank you for this nice presentation. Uh, I'm thinking about whether this is what you're describing is demand-driven in terms of by the voters or by what they get from the parties. I thought from the drift of your remarks that you analyze it in terms of demand-drivenness, but I'm not sure. Uh, if, if you look at the collapse of the vote uh, of uh, low-income voters, uh, you would, I would think that argues for supply-driven. And also, if you look at the very bad results of socio-democratic parties, and parties of the left in general, if you look in Germany, they've collapsed, and in uh, France, Social Democratic Party has disappeared. So it doesn't seem to be that this supply that they uh, provided was really very much uh, in tune with the demand of voters. Uh, so I wonder if, uh, if that looking at who voted for what really uh, gives the whole picture. Well, what you see by, by looking at who voted for whom is clearly a mixture of a lot of effects, and in particular, it's clearly a mixture of supply and demand and all sorts of factors, which cannot be disentangled just looking at this, that's for sure. Uh, so I think, you know, this kind of approach at looking at cleavages, of course, is not exclusive of other approaches, looking at party platform, looking at party program, looking at all sorts of other materials, which of course cannot, are not going to be uh, replaced by, by this. But this kind of approach, at least, this can tell us the, the advantage is that you know you can compare different period, different countries over a relatively long period of time in a way which is very difficult to do with a, a party platform analysis because the way you code party platform is not going to be fully comparable. Some people will disagree, etc. So at least here we can see how the changing uh, you know perceptions of the different parties and coalition you know how this has changed over time. Now clearly this will reflect a mixture of demand and supply. So um, look when I, I mentioned Corbyn at the end, this is a clear example you know, for the very last election of my graph where you have a very different evolution in the UK with a widening of the income versus education gap and in the US uh, and, and France where it, you know, high income tend to go uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, Clinton and for uh, Macron. Uh, now, it could have been very different with uh, Sanders uh, instead of Clinton in the primary. Uh, you know, nobody knows uh, what it would have given. It would be, that, you know, in France, you know, remember in France, you know, the first round of the presidential election, we had four candidates between 20 and 24. So you could have had any of the two at the second round, basically. You know, you could have had Mélenchon, Le Pen, Mélenchon, Macron, Mélenchon, Fillon, uh, Macron, uh, Fillon, whatever you want. And of course, the, the resulting cleavage at the end would have looked very, uh, very different. So I think supply factors uh, are very important. You know, what these different... Uh, and the electoral system is important also. And, uh, yeah, everything is important. And here I am... Yeah, I'm not... I'm not now, look, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not able to say, you know, this is demand. Now, I think it will be too simple to say it's all supply. You know, I think there's also some dialogue between the... You know, what people perceive, what people are asking for, what high education people... Uh, how high education people perceive... Their, uh, how much they are deserving, how much they deserve their, their uh, you know, high education level. You know, I think all these sort of popular perceptions of fairness and uh, deservingness uh, are important and shape what, what parties feel they can supply or adopt as platforms. Sometimes wrongly so, but, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's clearly, there's clearly a dialogue. Somebody in the back and the middle, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
the speaker before me has, mo uh, has said most of the things I wanted to say, but I just want to emphasize the point that the supply side is very important. Just one example, if you want to explain uh, why inequality um, has fallen in the 30s in the US, you must consider that Roosevelt called the Americans, your president wanted to join the union. So it was um, a result of a higher union, unionization rate, uh, a result of strong social movements, and even a democratic party, which was really different from the democratic party as now. So you have always to see the historical conjuncture if you want to explain a cleavage, and you can't, yeah. you can't explain it just by the demand patterns. Okay, so le let me say once again, you know, my main conclusion is that we need a much stronger uh, uh, internationalist egalitarian platform. So my, my main conclusion is definitely a supply side conclusion in the, in the sense that I want, uh, you know, I would like to see uh, parties that are putting forward uh, a platform that is much more redistributive, that is uh, having, uh, say, much more progressive taxation at the top in order to finance and invest in the education and the schools of the uh, you know, uh, bottom half of the population in the US, they don't get access to good public <laughs> services. And in France and Germany, it's a bit better, but it's not great either. And so I would like to see you know, a platform that does this. There's no, so uh, you know, my, my perspective is definitely that supply uh, uh, matters, and that actors matter, and political parties matter. And so uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, sorry if I gave the impression that I was describing the story from the point of view of the, of the voters only. To me, it's really a response. The, you know, the voters, uh, you know, are responding to to uh, to a supply, mm -hmm. and we could have a different supply with uh, Sanders, with Corbyn, with Mélenchon. None of this supply is perfect, uh, but uh, you know, these are different supply which we can compare. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's time for two more questions, please. Mm -hmm. Wait. Oh, oh, nice. um, it seems from what you're saying that the the groups that are most predictable are the high income, uh, low education, and high education, low income groups, whereas the groups that are least less predictable are the high on both and low on both. And those would be the ones that swing more, you know, from one election to the other. You know, so if we had had Sanders rather than Clinton, maybe the, the low, low group would have gone more with him. And it's a, I mean, I'm, I'm just, it's a comment. I, I yeah. don't know if you have any. No, uh, yeah, no, I think you're right. These are, well, these are the most, uh, unstable voters when you are in this multiple elite system. But now this multiple elite system, you know, could itself uh, not be a stable equilibrium. Uh, you know, it could be that we are going toward a situation where the, uh, you know, this is certainly what, uh, like, typically, you know, Ma Macron would like to have a political spectrum where he gets, uh, in effect, the high income, high education. Well, that's what all his policies uh, is targeted at. And, and uh, and to leave the low education and low income voting uh, against globalization, uh, that, that's what he wants, and he might be able to get it. Uh, in, in, the, in the US, uh, we'll see what happens with Trump, and uh, you know, in some Eastern European country, uh, if I, you know, I, we are, we are, I have some colleagues who are now looking at the structure of the vote in Poland and in Hungary. Uh, it's possible that we are, you know, we are already uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a stage where the the Fidesz is not really getting, uh, is certainly not getting the high education vote, but that is not even getting the high wealth uh, uh, vote or high income vote. I, I mean, I don't have, we've not seen all the data yet, but uh, so there's a possibility that this multiple system is, uh, itself goes away, and then the high income, high education actually become very predictable because they vote for the sort of globalist party, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. Responsive to the supply. Yes, this I don't fully know the answer. Which one is? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Chris. Uh, yeah, Chris Han. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciated this. Uh, but I'm just a simple anthropologist. Uh, I come from Wales, from a small town, which I would say fits your low education, low income category, and it was 60% Brexit. And I work in rural Hungary, again, among low education, low income voters, and they're overwhelmingly Fides, and those who are not Fides are further to the right. And I just look at your point there, without a strong egalitarian internationalist platform, uh, 
how on earth do you think in contemporary Europe, at those two extremes, Wales and Hungary, an egalitarian internationalist platform can work today? Yeah, well, tell me, tell me what's the other option. I mean, you can also, you can work for Fidesz uh, if you want. I mean, but, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, look, there's no, there's no simple uh, solution to this problem. You know, I'm, I'm just saying if there is not something that looks egalitarian and universalist and that is able to convince the water uh, in, in Wales or in, uh, or in the north of France or in, uh, or in rural Hungary more than it does today, then the, 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 you know, the, evo the possible evolution is this sort of nativist globalist evolution, which, uh, which uh, you know, is, is, is frightening, I think, in some way, because at some point, you know, the, 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 the bottom 90 percent is always uh, more numerous than the top 10 percent. So at some point, uh, the, the, this kind of evolution, uh, 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 you know, in the, in the long run, I think, can, can lead to big, uh, big disaster. And then it, can, it could also be, you could also have the Democratic Party evolution, where, you know, after the abolition of, of slavery and, you know, at the end, they, they evolve, they become the New Deal Party. But, you know, this took a century or this took 50 years, so this is not... A, so, I, but now... How could the universalist uh, egalitarian platform work? Well, you know, you have to convince voters that you can, uh, that you can uh, cooperate uh, to tax uh, multinationals, to tax high wealth groups, to tax high income groups uh, better uh, if you uh, do it through cooperation with other countries than if you are uh, Donald Trump or, uh, or Orban and, in fact, you are favoring... Uh, you know, top business uh, 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 even more. So, you know, the, 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 I think it's, uh, you know, it's complicated, but it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not impossible. Thank you very much.